Hi, I'm Lindsay Hull, Head of Thought Leadership at S&P Global Sustainable One. And I'm Esther Wielden, a senior writer on the Sustainable One Thought Leadership team. Welcome to ESG Insider, an S&P Global podcast where Esther and I take you inside the environmental, social, and governance issues that are shaping the rapidly evolving sustainability landscape. Esther, it's the opening day of the Summer Olympic Games. They kick off today in Paris, France, and continue for about the next two weeks. And I have to say, the Olympics are just so nostalgic for me. I spent my childhood alternately dreaming of being a figure skater in the winter or a gymnast during the Summer Olympics. Me and my best friends made a balance beam out of tape on the basement floor of my house to do our own routines during the 96 Summer Olympics, and that never came off the carpet. Sorry, Mom and Dad. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of nostalgia around the Olympics for me as well. I recently took up swimming again, and I have to say I have a lot of respect for the athletes because it takes me a long time to get from one end of my lane to the other end, and they just do it so fast. It's just really incredible. Over the past few weeks, we've turned our attention at the podcast to the topic of sustainability in sports. And this is because in addition to the Olympics, there are so many big sporting events happening this summer. Last week, we heard from the head of sustainability and responsible business at a professional soccer team based in Madrid, Spain. She explained how sustainability is a rising focus thanks to pressure from many sources, including spectators, investors, sponsors, and even regulators. Today, we're talking to another professional sporting organization with a deep focus on sustainability. I'm talking about Formula E. You may have heard of Formula One race cars. Well, Formula E was launched a decade ago as a championship specifically for electric vehicles. In case you missed it, Formula E just finished its 10th season over the past weekend with a tense final in London. Today, we're speaking with a leader from Formula E about how the sport is approaching sustainability and how electric vehicle technology is evolving. You'll hear her mention work Formula E does with DHL. That's the Global Logistics and Shipping Company. Okay, let's turn to my interview. My name is Julia Palais. I'm VP of Sustainability at Formula E, which means my role is actually basically to bring the vision and the mission of Formula E, which is to accelerate sustainable human progress using the power of electric racing, to turn that into a reality within the championship and the series to make sure that we are basically the most sustainable sport in the world, not only because we are using electric vehicles and we're racing uh, and powering these electric vehicles with uh, renewable energy, but because we have a wider purpose, which is to inspire people to live sustainable lifestyles and to adopt notably, you know, electric driving, but also other forms of uh, more sustainable everyday tips. For our listeners who might not be familiar with Formula E, what should they know? So Formula E is the only all-electric racing series in the world. Uh, We were created 10 years ago to be able to promote and showcase electric uh, vehicle technology. And really, Formula E is unique in the sense that we showcase the best of sport and motorsports, So super thrilling, exciting races. And we showcase that you can do all of that by being the most sustainable as possible. So as I mentioned, the the electric vehicles are charged by renewable energy. On our events, we basically try and basically get rid of any kind of forms of single-use plastics. We encourage people to use public transport coming to to our events and so on. So we do all the fun, but on top of that, being sustainable and good for people and the planet. So you mentioned you've been around for 10 years and what has changed in that decade? So over the last 10 years at Formula E, obviously our own sustainability strategy has been evolving. We really started initially focusing on the environmental aspects. So all the measurements, the carbon reductions of our series. So how we would, you know, like try and use a different approach to logistics, try and have a more clusterized approach to a calendar and so on. We've been using recently some uh, breakthrough innovations with DHL using sustainable aviation fuel to transport or freight. But also we've been really ultimately ramping up to a more social impact of the series. One of the best examples is the Girls on Track programs that we are now running at every single event. It's a grassroots program designed to inspire young girls and empower them to work and embrace STEM careers. We 
take them at the track the day before the race at every single race location and they get a series of workshops they get to drive electric cars they get to meet with the teams and the drivers and so we really are now harnessing on the power of inspiring people to change their lifestyles also to create positive social impact and long-lasting legacies in the different places where we race. So when you talk about sustainability, it's not just that environmental aspect. It's also the social aspects. What data are you looking at to measure sustainability in sports, whether it's environmental, social, or otherwise? So data is always the starting point. That's the almost the most important thing to get started and to have a good understanding of, of where you're standing. So we are measuring our carbon footprint. We use a methodology that is called life cycle assessment, third party certified, so validated by external and independent auditors. And with these, basically, we have a good understanding of the carbon footprint of the series. It's quite stable in terms of impact. We know that 70 to 75% of the carbon footprint is linked to the freight that we transport around the world. You have to think about us like a traveling circus. And so we transport the race cars around the world and a few other things. And this is one of the key, basically key challenges and also key opportunities in terms of innovative technologies to continually reduce our carbon footprint that we use. That's why the partnership with DHL is so important to us. And the newly tested technology around sustainable aviation fuel has been so important. But we also use data in terms of the social impact. So just this year, if we take the example of Girls on Track, we will have doubled the impact that we created across all the race locations that we've been in, impacting over 2,000 girls across the season. And that's doubled the impact that we have created sorry, since we started the program back in uh, 2019. So it's a very important point for us to be able to understand the impact that we create also from a social perspective. Okay, great. So we've been doing a mini series of this podcast looking at sustainability in sports. And what I've been hearing so far is that a lot of professional sports organizations are only in the early stages of even thinking about sustainability, which sounds like a very different place than where Formula E is, since sustainability is sort of part of your mandate right from the get go. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We were funded with sustainability at the heart of the, the series. OK. And so I wonder, do you have conversations with other sporting organizations, whether it's racing or other sports in general? And, and like, what do you see in your peers outside of Formula E when it comes to how they're thinking about sustainability? Yes, it, it's very important for us to maintain a, a constant dialogue with other sports organizations, because if there's one territory where obviously a sport is about competition, but there should not be competition, it's on sustainability because we have no time. The challenge is too big, so we need to support each other. And so we are part of notably uh, a series of organizations such as United Nations Sports for Climate Action that gathers, I would say, most of the main sports on the planet. And that basically enables all those sports to have a sort of like common place to be discussing challenges. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, there are very different levels of maturity in the sports industries. Some people that are just at the start thinking about it, some people that are a bit more advanced, some that are really advanced. But I think what is interesting is to talk about our common challenges because it's uh, obviously it's interesting to share you know the success stories. But the common challenges, I think, it's where we are actually stronger together. We were actually discussing recently some potential opportunities to get together to understand better our fans' perceptions, combining the global power of sports and understanding what moves the dial from a fan perspective or other, you know, like potential technical aspects around carbon measurements. And I think this is very important. So we always make sure that uh, as we push forward our sustainability and our leadership in sports around sustainability, it's our commitment to share and to give back so that uh, everyone can be benefiting from this. And so we're having this conversation um, at a pretty pivotal time for Formula E. If I understand correctly, this coming weekend is the finals. What should our audience understand about 
the Formula E season and what's happening in just a couple of days here? So the, the Formula E season is basically six months worth of fully thrilling, exciting racing with the culmination point this week, actually this weekend in London, uh, where we will crown our season winning driver and obviously our winning team. And that's very important to us. And it's not only about the sport, obviously it, it's everything is led by the excitement of the sport, but it's also how we We've been integrating sustainability at the heart of every single event. In London, it's going to be also a culmination of all the efforts we've, we've had in terms of environmental impact, renewable energy being used, uh, water fountains with reusable cups, introduction of an education-led activity in the kids' area so that they can learn about sustainability in terms of what is renewable energy, what is climate change, what is diversity, equity, and inclusion for uh, under 10 years old plus all the philanthropic aspects of our Better Futures Fund program that basically is supporting local charities in niche race locations that we have. And in the London specific case, it's all about basically a charity that is going to be supporting with people suffering from basically not having access to food. And so in essence, uh, how we're going to support families in having food access secured. Can you help me understand a little bit more about the different stakeholders that you work with. You mentioned your fans. Let's start there, perhaps. How would you describe the Formula E fan base? Yeah, so the Formula E fan base is quite unique. We have, first of all, a, a quite gender balanced fan base, which is quite unusual and I would say uh, really fantastic for us as a young and I would say kind of a disruptive sport in the positive sense. Also quite young, our demographic is mostly under 35 years old. And then if you sort of like start categorizing the funds, then you've got those that are families and parents that are basically worried about the future of their children because they hear a very doom and gloom narrative around climate change, which is why we are trying to be solution driven and very positive. You also have, I mean, two categories of funds that are quite tech, tech driven and, and very focused on the innovations that we are putting forward at the center really of, of the sport and, you know, like really the innovations that are developed in our garages and that are going to be transferred into the cars that you and I are going to be driving in a year or in a couple of years. And then there's also a very interesting segment, quite female-led, very focused on the social impact that we create as a sport, where they are really here to experience, but are here to be part of a wider community that creates a uh, positive social impact. So you mentioned some of those innovations. I'd love to know more about what did those look like? What are the innovations that Formula E is bringing to the table? So we've designed the championship so that we can get our uh, manufacturers to maximize the opportunity to innovate in, I would say, almost uh, ready to go plug and play transferable innovations that uh, will go into passenger cars. One of the best examples is Jaguar. So Jaguar has been racing with us uh, almost since the beginning of the of the series. And Jaguar, a couple of years ago, introduced a software update that came directly from the learnings that they had in the garages, so on their racing car, that enabled all their iPace SUV uh, drivers to get an extra 10% battery life thanks to a, a better, like a, let's say, like a software uh, technology. And so if you take that at the world level, like the thousands of users, this gives a substantial impact on the everyday life potential and technology transfer opportunities uh, from what we call track to road. One thing that I have been reading about is this new fast charging technology at Formula E. Is that something you can tell me more about? What, what should our listeners know about fast charging? Yeah, so in essence, the way we design our racing cars is that we try and be basically ahead of the cycle, mostly for 10 years. So we try to think about the cars that will be used on the streets and making sure that we tackle the challenges that the users on the streets are facing and solve that in the racing cars so that the technology can be implemented in the passenger cars. And so uh, one of the things that we have identified after really pushing hard in terms of the reliability and the battery life of the cars is very much about the infrastructure, the fact that the infrastructure is still not enough on the street, but also the fact that it's not fast enough in terms of uh, time to charge. And so that's why we've started to think about these ultra-fast charging solutions 
that we want to implement in the championship and showcase that through our cars, ultra fast charging is a technology that is existing, that is proving, you know, efficient and that will be transferred on the short term in the streets that people driving electric vehicles will be able to use. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, this this fast charging technology that's been rolled out at Formula E for race cars, you think is eventually going to make its way to road cars? Yeah, absolutely. So we're working on uh, rolling this out in the series because we know that it's going to be a game changer element to support the acceleration of EV adoption even more widely than it is at the moment. And so the idea is that by showcasing that we use that in the context of the series, which is obviously like high intensity, very demanding, showcasing fast, ultra fast charging, the transfer to the everyday users on the streets is going to be obviously like facilitated and accelerated. And also basically something that will enable uh, everyday passenger drivers to project themselves as a technology they can use. Hence, basically not, not seeing that as a barrier to adoption to drive an electric vehicle. Okay. I mean, that makes sense because anecdotally, a lot of what I hear about why people aren't moving to electric vehicles is the lack of infrastructure and the time that it takes to charge an electric vehicle. When you talk about fast charging technology, like how long are we talking? So the, the technology that we're looking at, I would say between 10 and 30 seconds to charge roughly between 10 and 20% of the batteries. Okay, wow. So yeah, very fast. So we've talked about some of the fans. Talk to me about some of the other stakeholders that you engage with, whether it's sponsors or the car companies. Yeah, of course. So some very important stakeholders for us are the car manufacturers and the customer teams. So in the championship, we have 11 teams that are either directly run by a car manufacturer, a big brand as Jaguar that we talked about, or Porsche, or, you know, McLaren and so on. Or you'll have customer teams that are basically, you know, Andretti, who won their driver won last year, or Envision, that's won as as the team winning team last year. And so these people basically are, you know, building a team and racing as individual private owners of a racing team. And that's very, very important to us to have both because you've got the car manufacturers that are here to develop uh, and advance and transfer the technology into the road cars. But it's also very important to bring the thrill and the excitement of the private teams that normally come also from a a very rich motorsport history or come from an adjacent industry to, uh, you know, motorsport and electric vehicles as the likes of Envision, where it's very important for us to showcase this sort of like wider ecosystem implication in the sort of like bigger transformation of our society is going to more environmental technological solutions. And then what about other sources of pressure or other stakeholders that you work with? One of the things that's come up in my previous interviews for this mini series about sustainability in sports is the role of regulations. Is regulation at all driving your approach to sustainability? Of course, we we do operate, obviously, um, to deliver our events. We have a series of laws and regulations that are very important for us, not only to be aware, but also to to make sure that we comply with. Uh, In terms of sustainability, obviously, um, our philosophy is to always go above and beyond. So there are some certifications that we have to basically always make sure that we maintain ourselves at the highest level possible and available in our industries. So just to give you an example, we've been certified against the International Standard for Sustainability in Events, which roughly, mostly it's the Olympic uh, Games that uh, adhere to this uh, I mean, uh, level of recognition. It's an ISO standard. So it's been eight years that we are certified against these standards. We were the first part in the world to achieve net zero carbon since inception in line with the 2020 definitions of science-based targets and so on and so forth. So this is very, very important for us to be always at the forefront of those regulatory frameworks, whether they are imposed to us or done on a voluntary basis out of, again, uh, best practice and leadership. You you talked about the UN's Sports for Climate Action Initiative. Can you tell me a little bit more about Formula E's involvement in this initiative and and what you've gleaned from that? 
Yeah, of course. So we we contributed to actually create the first frame framework back in 2018. So we were around the table with the United Nations and a couple of other sports when basically United Nations decided to use and gather the, the, the collective power of sports, not as an industry that was, you know, generating huge impact in terms of environmental CO2 emissions, but as a fantastic industry that could really kind of gather billions of people and inspire them through the power of sport to uh, adopt more sustainable uh, practices in their everyday lives. First of all, by you know putting their own houses in order, and then by showcasing to their spectators that there are some everyday tips, as I was mentioning, that can be taken to live a more sustainable lifestyle without feeling that it's necessarily a constraint. Okay. And so what are some of the common challenges or opportunities that you have seen arise out of this framework? So one of the common challenges that we've identified is the fact that most sports are struggling with the transportation aspects. I think I've mentioned that uh, 75% of the carbon footprint of Formula E is basically due to the fact that we travel around the world. And so it's a common problem that we're facing that ultimately this is something that most sports and Formula E in particular have no direct control on. We are obviously relying on the reality of the freight industry that is not necessarily you know, like a, the most advanced industry at the moment. But again, the beauty is that uh, there are some, you know, most advanced players in this industry. We're lucky to work with DHL, which is our logistics partner, and uh, and DHL is enabling us to potentially test and trial new technologies. We've been using for a couple of uh, seasons already biofuels for all the sea freight and the road freight. We just recently tested the sustainable aviation fuel for air freight. And it's something that with the rest of the sport, we're actually discussing how we could come together and basically use or sort of collective bargaining power almost as a lobby, a voice in front of the rest of the travel and freight industry saying that we're ready basically to go for more sustainable solutions, but they need to be made available to us. So you've talked about traveling all over the world for your events. And I wonder how does the interest in or enthusiasm for Formula E and also sustainability more broadly, how does that differ from geography to geography? So what is very interesting is that we see that the fans that we have in more mature countries are very switched on the uh, social aspects of our sustainability uh, strategy. And so they are much more tuned on the goes on track, the philanthropic approach that we have, all the community engagement measures and so on and so forth. Uh, because I think in more mature market, there's a bit of environmental fatigue um, based on, you know, like uh, the access to media and so on and so forth. Whereas in emerging markets, so those economy that are economies that are really like super dynamic and and completely, uh, I mean, in their like uh, booming phase from the economic perspective, they are very switched on the environmental side of sustainability. So very interested in how we can improve air quality through uh, the EV transformation, how we can support by utilizing more renewable energy. And that's uh, how basically we decided to choose our carbon credits uh, selection as part of our net zero carbon strategy. We only purchase renewable energy carbon certificates because we want to make sure that we support the increased use of renewable energy in the, in the different grids in the world and so on. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that based on the, the different growth phase of the different geographies where we race, fans and people are, are are sensitive to different aspects, which is great for us because obviously our sustainability strategy is holistic. What is, from your perspective, the big hurdle or challenge in greater uptake of these kinds of strategies by other organizations? Like, why is not everyone not taking these these same steps? I think um, it's it's probably more difficult when you're a company that, unlike us, were born with without a purpose. We were born with sustainability at the heart of everything that we do with. It's, it's a reason to be. Whereas if you've been existing for tens of years 
and you're trying basically to retrofit, in essence, a purpose to your organization and then justify that you're going to invest resources, even if it makes sense from a moral perspective, the business is not set up in such way where potentially they see that it's going to help positively impact the triple bottom line. So I think that's why you see some businesses and, and potentially some sports are are maybe struggling to get started. Mm -hmm. Okay, you raise an important point there, which is that sports is often thought of as entertainment, but it also has this really important business component. Can you talk to me more about what's the role of investors in Formula E and what you're hearing from your investment community? Yeah, so our investors are absolutely crucial because formerly, if you think about it, it's just 10 years old. So we're still a very young business that needs to be uh, supported in terms of what we say, capital and confidence. So we need people that are, you know, seeing the huge potential that we have and that are basically ready to support us financially to get there. And I think, uh, I mean, we've had recently a fantastic news with uh, Liberty Global taking majority ownership within Formula E, which is a testament of basically them seeing us as basically like a trailblazer in the sports industry and really seeing the potential for us to become a major, not only entertainment brand, but holistic brand in terms of sport. So the sport is good, it's exciting, but they're also recognizing the unique place and role that we play in terms of inspiring, you know, like the rest of the industries to to be more sustainable. And as we were just discussing before, uh, this being a, a key business driver in terms of, you know, like uh, the financial health of our business and, and ultimately inspiring others to do so. Okay. And Julia, I always like to ask our guests about their personal path. How did you get into this role leading sustainability at Formula E? So I'm a, an economist initially by training and I've be, I became a sustainability expert when studying in a business and management school. And then by luck or chance or whatever you want to call that, I happened to find my first role, uh, which I wanted to be in, in an industrial environment in motorsport. So I started working for Michelin, the French um, tire manufacturers, almost 15 years ago now. In my role, I instantly understood that motorsport was a fantastic industry with such untapped opportunities in terms of sustainability, um, major potential emissions in terms of uh, carbon emissions, but also huge potential in terms of creating impact and inspiring people. And so I've had all my career in, in motorsport and I'm now celebrating my 10 years at Formula E. So I've been really part of uh, shaping up the, the business and, and very proud of what we've achieved and, and where we are going really. So as we heard from Julia today, a lot of evolution happening in this sport. She talked about how Formula E has been focused on sustainability since its launch 10 years ago and how this in some ways makes its path more straightforward than legacy sports that are trying to retrofit sustainability into their business model. Julia talked about the role that bodies like the UN's Sports for Climate Action Initiative can play in using sports to achieve global climate change goals. This group has come up in multiple of my interviews for this series, by the way. And we've heard throughout the series about the importance of sharing best practices across sports and teams. Julia also said that for Formula E, data is always a starting point. And she talked about the crucial role that investors play in the sporting world. This is a theme we've heard throughout this series how sports aren't just entertainment, they're also big business. And as Julia mentioned in June 2024, Liberty Global announced plans to acquire additional shares of Formula E, giving it a controlling interest in the motorsport. There is so much more to tell in this sustainability and sports story. We hope you've enjoyed the snapshot we brought you in these last three episodes, and that you continue to tune in as we explore how a range of actors are getting to grips with this evolving sustainability landscape. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of ESG Insider. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe, share, and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And a special thanks to our agency partner, The 199. See you next time.